Are you remembering the uh, reading today is from Isaiah 40, 21 through 31? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are willing or like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely so, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows upon them, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stumble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength. Mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, the 29th to the 39th verses. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. The fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he gathered many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon's and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go into the neighboring town, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for this is what I came to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out the demons. So, last week, we talked about demons. We talked about the unknown man who came into the synagogue while Jesus was teaching, and he stopped, and he paid attention to that man who was in need of healing, who was in need of getting rid of those demons. And we talked about what those might be for us today, whether they're depression, whether their illness, whether their guilt, anything that holds us back and keeps us away from God. Jesus took care of that man and healed him that day in the synagogue. And here we see, just after that, right after the time in the synagogue, he goes right next door to Simon's house, that's Simon Peter, and heals Simon's mother-in-law. 
So he's just moving right along with his, with his ministry. He often is said to have gone immediately, when we're talking about Mark, immediately he goes to this place, immediately he did this, immediately he healed this person. He's already somewhat of a sensation from expelling the demon and the man in the crowd, and everybody's talking about it. So he goes and slips away into this private home where he's told about Simon's mother-in-law, and he heals her. Sometimes this woman is actually described as being the very first deacon, because as soon as he healed her, she got up and started taking care of them, serving them. As soon as she was done with this fever, she got up and went on with her own personal and particular ministry. Like a lot of the households that we have today, Simon's household doesn't quite fit the usual nuclear unit of a husband and a wife and children. Not only is his mother-in-law living with him, but she is apparently in charge of hospitality for the home, and that's something that carries its own particular honor. And as we study more, we're actually doing some studies in Bible study that bring up a lot about hospitality and what that means. But part of the reason she moved in may be a dependency upon Simon, because she had no other man in her life to provide for her. And Simon needed her help in running the household while he went and fished. Now, his wife is never even mentioned very often in the story in the New Testament, but his wife is not mentioned. But in any case, the mother-in-law, who doesn't have a name, she's sick, she's got this fever, couldn't take care of her duties, couldn't take care of her roles, couldn't continue in her ministry because there was something holding her back in her personal health. She couldn't even take her place in the community because of her sickness and take care of her business. Mark's prose in this is really simple as he presents the problem and Jesus' response. A response that might remind us of something else. He lifted or raised her up. However, in raising her up, he also restored her to her rightful place and her rightful role. So she proceeded directly to serving him. Mark doesn't say that Jesus spoke any special words or that he did anything more dramatic than simply taking her by the hand. And that brought her from unwholeness to wholeness. Very often in scripture when touch is described, when Jesus takes someone by the hand or someone touches someone or anoints someone, it really is a metaphor for something that is a powerful and intimate presence of the Spirit of God in a person's life. So right here, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, after all those dramatic things, the River Jordan and the sky opening up with the, the time in the wilderness, all the unclean spirits shrieking, his first healing his first healing, not talking about casting out demons, talking about healing someone who is sick, it's accomplished through a gentle, tender touch. That feeling expresses what it was that she could trust and receive. Because if someone just says, I love you, I care about you, I hope you get better, and that's it, it's not easily felt, it's not easily made real to the person. So God, He knew the power of touch and nearness. He knew the power of a hug, or just reaching out and touching someone's hand. And 
in Mark's Gospel and the other Gospels. Jesus is an actual incarnation, a tangible expression, an explanation of God's love for us, something we can touch and feel. There's an old expression called, oh, taste and see. It's the same kind of thing, making, making caring real, making our own personal ministries and caring about each other to have strength and meaning, something tangible, something that sustains them and that sustains the people we're ministering to. <clears throat> then, of course, we see that all these other people come to the house to do that, to get healed, to become well. They are all seeking wholeness. And throughout this whole thing, Jesus doesn't let what they refer to here anyway as the demons speak. He doesn't because they know his name. And he doesn't want it to be all about him. He wants it to be about the ministry. He says, go back. I want to uh, let us go to the neighboring town so I may proclaim the message there also. That is what I came to do. Sharing the message. <laughs> Not getting elected most popular. The other interesting thing to me about this story in Mark is that we have this passage where after he does this healing, he goes off somewhere, right? The disciples come along and they say, where have you been? They've been hunting for us. What happened was in the morning before dawn, he went out and he prayed. He went out and he waited for God. He went out and listened to God. He went out and became refreshed in his spirit. And meanwhile, everybody else is like, where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where is he? Where is he? I need more. Everyone is searching for him. In the New Revised Standard, they say they hunted for him. It's kind of scary. But, but... <clears throat> Once having experienced that love and that touch and that healing, they wanted more. But Jesus knew he had to be able to sustain that power and that love and that healing. So he went out in the dark to a quiet place and prayed. When we heard the reading from Isaiah, We heard about the eagle, those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The key there is waiting for the Lord. There's a story about eagles, and I'm going to look up my notes so I get it right. It's, um, you know, it's one of those hand-me-down stories. I don't know how scientifically it's been um, validated. Maybe Elliot can find out for us. <laughs> <That's Elliot. laughs> but um, legend tells us, anyway, that an eagle, when they get to be somewhere between 30 and 50 years old, flies to a high place and endures a really harsh trial of endurance and change. Its feathers have become overgrown, so it plucks its feathers out, and its talons have become curved up and too long, and so it plucks talons, and the beak is all curled, so it has to hit it against the rock to trim it, like our parakeets and their cuddle bones, you know. Um, but when it does all of that, while it's waiting to regenerate, it is completely vulnerable. It doesn't have all those talons anymore. It doesn't have that big, strong beak anymore. But it cries out and it waits for renewal. And the other eagles hear the cry, fly overhead, scare off the predators, and bring food while the eagle waits. He 
goes through a harsh trial, endurance and change, and yet he comes out at the end of it soaring. Soaring on God's wings. I'm not saying that Jesus was like the eagle and, and going to prepare for that. But I am saying that he knew he needed sustenance. He knew he needed to commune with his creator, father, mother, God. As we are now the hands and the feet of Jesus, and as we are fulfilling God's ministry by our own actions, we sometimes grow tired. <clears throat> and we sometimes aren't sure how to respond and how to keep going on. Maybe something happens that upsets us or something falls apart that we don't expect to fall apart or something happens like that. There's a lot of assumptions made about us, just like there were about Jesus. He said, oh, he can do anything, but he had to go off and pray. And so do we. We have to go off and pray. And we have to hear the Spirit of God and follow that lead. Now, Jesus' ministry, it was preaching and healing. And healing and preaching. Kind of in a nutshell. And that sort of describes our ministry in the community as well. We should be telling good news. We should be sharing that good news and that love and that hope. And we should be healing the things between ourselves and between our community and with other people and providing a place for rest, providing a place for sustenance, providing a place where we can grow strong and build our ministries. So we have to think about it. What is the purpose of our church? What is our particular congregation known for? Are we known as being small and really quiet? Small maybe. Quiet, not all the time. Are we large and famous? No, we're not large and famous. This passage in Mark describes a private healing in a home, a small one-on-one -on -one ministry. It follows a very public one, the casting out of the demon in the synagogue. So God's power works in all of those kinds of places. So what we want to look at is how is God's power working in the life of our church, but also beyond the walls of our church. How are we sharing it? What are the perils of becoming well known as a congregation or a pastor? What are the blessings? How did prayer and quiet time happen in our lives here at Bethel and in your individual lives? How does prayer and quiet time happen for each of you? How do you recharge your spirit? <clears throat> How do we become reoriented when we lose our way, lost our focus? Is there a problem with coming to Jesus and seeing him only as a healer? Just food for thought for all of you. There aren't really right answers <coughs> to all of those. <clears throat> I think we're small, not particularly quiet. I don't think we're large yet. We're not particularly famous. We have an amazing history. So there is some fame. We work beyond our walls. We do that. With the pet food bank, with our arts programs. <coughs> with each and every one of your individual ministries. And we work within our walls. The big question for me here today for all of us is how do we recharge our spirits? 
I hope that in some ways you get to do that on Sundays. But I hope you have a way to do it in between. A week is a long time to go if this is the only place you get food. If our church is truly part of the body of Christ, how do we live out our call to be healers to those who are gathered at the door of our church seeking God's mercy? And how do we live out our call to also proclaim the message? Because we have to do both. We have to heal and we have to proclaim. We have to provide sustenance and strength and we have to build ministries and proclaim them to the world. I'm going to give you a few verses about being with God. This is just for each and every one of you when you want to take your own personal time and pray or meditate about God. So I'm going to give you a few. One of them is from Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Another is from Second Chronicles, Jehoshaphat, a real person, right? He's praying. He says, Our eyes are set upon you. God is our only hope. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only He will release my feet from the snare. If we look at Isaiah 55, we're told that God works in His own time and way. If we look back at the story of Elijah, we see that his strength to serve God was renewed after his fresh encounter with God. In 1 Kings, we hear about God stirring up nature. But the verses tell us in 1 Kings 19, 10 to 13, that God wasn't in the windstorm, earthquake, or fire, but in the stillness. So whatever situations we are each in, they can be like the eagle, a trial for endurance and change. Or they can be like Simon's mother-in-law, a fever that is healed with a touch. Whatever it is, that contact with love, with God, is what keeps us strong and keeps us able and helps us to share our ministry. We're never forsaken. We just need to wait upon the Lord and then act upon the Lord's message so that we can soar like eagles. Amen. Amen.